DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual direction according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He's also the author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, as well as other works focused on aspects of the spiritual life. A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope. With Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. So we move now to seven years later. Leonie is 78 at this point. We're in 1941, so we're in full World War II. The preceding year, Marie has died, the eldest, so she is the first of the four sisters to die. So this is a letter of uh, Leonie to her two Carmelite sisters. It's been the three all along. Now it's two. And she's writing on Easter, so Lent has finished and she's free to write again. April 13th. Darling little sisters, the time has come. I can feel it. I'm going into my eternity. So it's no longer that when will this happen and as long as you want, Lord, but she knows now the time has come. What bliss. I'm completely settled in the infirmary. So she's no longer in her own cell in the monastery, but needs to be cared for. Your dearest wish and mine will be fulfilled for our matchless mother lamb. So the prioress in their own, in her monastery was called mother Agnes as well. Will be the one to close my eyes and you being inseparably united to her dear and blessed person will be there as well through her. From your arms, I hope I will fall into those of our most merciful savior and his most holy mother, my darling mama and into those of all our relatives, the blessed and glorious inhabitants of the heavenly homeland. So heaven for her is the meeting with Jesus, Mary, as she mentions, but it's also very centrally for her, the union again with the family members. Passionately loved little sisters, I can't write another word. I'm growing more frail. All that remains healthy are my knees, heart, and thank God my head. She was really afraid as she watched her health decline that she might go the way of her father. The institution where her father was uh, placed when he had his mental problems was in the same city of Kong. And so she's very well aware. She even wonders at some point, will I finish my days there? But what she says here is beautiful. All that remains healthy are my knees, heart, and thank God my head. But he can take all this. Everything is his. Total abandon is my goal, down to my very modest, poor understanding. If he wants to take even my mind from me, that's fine, whatever he wants. I'm quite overwhelmed considering how much affection and consideration I'm receiving from Mama Lam, that is her superior, and all my dear sisters. She always marvels at that. Your little visitation sister, whose heart is very great and loving. So her body is is, uh, weakening, but her heart is very great and loving. Six days later, and she's writing to Celine. Now, the background to this is some kind of writing appears to be going on about the family through the sisters in the Carmel, and they apparently have written to her to ask some details about Louise, the maid. And in a preceding letter, she said something to them about that. Because that is in her mind, she writes this about Louise. I wholeheartedly forgive my persecutor, And I'm very grateful to her for having nursed our darling mama during her last illness with affection and true devotion, which she did. Darling little mama, so this is uh, her sister Pauline, I could well die suddenly. My heart is being constricted by my ribs, which are on top of each other. I choke when I cough and sneeze. It's almost enough to make me cry. And then she says, I'm too small to be damned. Little children are not damned. I'm hoping to fall into Jesus' loving and merciful arms. I'm not afraid of him. And as I mentioned earlier, there was never, ever a time in her life when uh, Leonie was afraid of God, nor afraid of death, 
and what would await her. Uh, little children are too small to be lost. I'm not afraid of it. And this is the final letter that I'll quote here. So this is May 25th, and as I mentioned, she died about five weeks later. Beloved little sisters, my heart is bursting at seeing so much affection on your part. So they're writing, well, we'll see it in a moment, but they sent a couple of these turn sisters to be there. The tears I shed are very sweet. I can feel your prayers significantly helping me climb my Calvary, together with the blessings of our family up above, and in particular, those of our holy visitation aunt, whom I love so dearly and venerate still. This is a little note from the soul of a great sinner, one who cannot be afraid of God. This is a well-lived life that leads to this. On the contrary, and here it is again, it's Therese, but it's now it's pure Leonie. On the contrary, it's my extreme poverty that makes me so confident. And it fills me with joy to think that when I leave the maternal arms of our beloved mother, her own superior, I'll quite naturally fall into those of Jesus and my heavenly mama. How bold I am. Your little sister who loves you so very dearly, Sister Francoise Therese. And then, as I mentioned, five weeks later, she would die. Now, I think the best way to speak of her final days, her death, and what followed is to quote from the obituary that I mentioned earlier. And so I'm just going to read what her fellow visitation sisters wrote about her last days and all that happened in them. And I think it'll be a fitting conclusion to the story of the life we've been sharing. So on June 11th, the Feast of the Blessed Sacrament, she showed herself to be most happy at recreation. She observed that day the anniversary of her baptism. She was always proud of that. She read for the community her canonized sister's act of oblation to merciful love. In fact, she was given permission decades earlier, I haven't mentioned it, to pray that prayer daily. For many years of her life, she prayed that prayer every day. She read this part of it reciting, I cannot receive Holy Communion as often as I desire because in Therese's time, they were not allowed to receive communion daily. But Lord, are you not all-powerful? Remain in me as in a tabernacle and never separate yourself from your little host. She emphasized touchingly, without musing, without doubting, but firmly, that after that morning's communion would come the viaticum, so she expects that her death will be coming fairly quickly. On the following day, our courageous sister, and partly why I want to read this too is because now we see her through the eyes of her own sisters who lived with her, the visitation sisters, and you see the affection for her. On the following day, our courageous sister began to rise very early, as was our custom, fearing that she would not be in time to receive her God. A few minutes later, her infirmarian came to help her dress, but instead found her unconscious. Our very honorable mother was immediately alerted and judged her condition to be grave. She alerted the chaplain to give her the last sacraments before celebrating Mass. The dear patient was unable in the subsequent hours to communicate to us her thoughts, since she had lost the power of speech, a great sacrifice for one of such an expansive nature. Two uh, external sisters from the Carmel of Lisieux, so they've informed uh, the sisters in uh, Carmel, and as I say, this is a lovely thing, they send two of the sisters who can travel to be there for all of this, to be there, and then of course to later share all of this with the sisters in Carmel arrived in the afternoon bearing the comforting intentions of her two well-loved Carmelite sisters, both of whom felt closer to her then than ever before. Through this special privilege, we were able to receive them into the, our cloister, so they allowed these two uh, externs to come in. Thus giving our sister Francoise Therese the consolation of recognizing them and receiving their smiles one last time. This state of weakness and suffering lasted for another five days. During this time, we surrounded her with prayers, and each evening the chaplain would come to renew the grace of holy absolution, staying to bless and preside in the recitation of the rosary prayed around the bed of our venerable and firm sister. Each morning after Holy Communion, our very reverend mother would come to Leonie's sickbed to finish her act of thanksgiving. That's a nice thing, you know. 
She's making her Thanksgiving and she comes to pray at Leonie's bed. Leonie would ceaselessly finger the rosary beads that came from her well-loved sister, Marie of the Sacred Heart, which she had requested and received from the Carmel. She, when Marie had died, she'd asked for her rosary. She had that. And in her last months, she, she always had that in her hands. And in the other hand, the profession crucifix of St. Therese of the Child Jesus, kissing each in turn. She seemed much moved when we sang the saints' verses. So this verse that they're singing from Therese, probably her most famous poem, To Live in Love, quoting Therese, To die of love, a sweet martyrdom, that I wish to suffer. O cherubim, tune your lyres, since my exile is about to end. Nearby, there was a reproduction of the statue of the Virgin of the Smile that had miraculously cured Therese. She gazed upon it with an ineffable smile of her own and stretched her arms toward the image while we murmured these familiar words of Therese, You who came to smile at me in the morning of my life, come and smile once more, Mother, at its close. Her life, like a beautiful evening, moved serenely toward its mortal conclusion. Our sister waited calmly for the blessed moment when she would receive her eternal embrace. In imitation of her sister, the saint, she spent several hours before the end throwing rose petals upon her crucifix from flowers that her two Carmelite sisters had cut from the Lisieux Monastery Garden. Now, Therese had done that when she was in her last days. They brought her roses, and she would pick the petals and just place them upon the crucifix. Uh, Leonie does this in imitation of Therese with roses, which her two sisters have sent from the Carmel. She really is surrounded with uh, exquisite touches of love, you know, in these moments. On the evening of June 16th, Leonie visibly weakened, holding firmly in one hand her crucifix and rosary and a wax agnus day in the other. Our very reverend mother and those sisters in attendance redoubled their prayers, invoking above all the Most Holy Virgin under her titles of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and Our Lady of the Visitation. St. Therese of the Child Jesus and her blessed parents, all of whom could not fail to assist her in this supreme hour. A supernatural atmosphere was felt in the room when all of a sudden Leonie came out of the torpor which had absorbed her for the last several hours, and she bestowed a luminous smile upon our Mother Superior and the two beloved extern sisters from Carmel who knelt by the bedside. Very moved, our Mother blessed her one last time, and in the midst of tears embraced her in the name of Pauline and Celine. Then Leonie's eyes closed, and without the death rattle, and after a few audible sighs, she seemed to fall asleep in the arms of the Lord. The date was the anniversary of the apparition of the Sacred Heart to Margaret Mary. The Magnificat was the prayer that our Reverend Mother was inspired to say, which is a beautiful thing. You would expect the prayer the De Profundis, the prayers for the dead, eternal rest grant unto them. But they're so convinced of how this life has been lived and ended that they sing the Magnificat. The Magnificat was the prayer that our Reverend Mother was inspired to say, feeling the need to thank God for the graces he had bestowed upon this humble and faithful soul. Beneath white roses, our dear Sister Francoise Therese appeared to reflect the peace and happiness of the eternal. She had a beautiful smile that we did not tire of contemplating. And then they conclude with a few words on her funeral and burial. On the Feast of the Sacred Heart, we had to forego the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament in order for our sister to be laid out in the chapel. This was done to accommodate the demands of the faithful who asked to have an opportunity to pray before her remains. Thousands came to join in the rosary recited. She's a sister of St. Therese. Rose recited aloud by our pious chaplain. Many of the faithful asked that religious objects, flowers, and images be touched to the crucifix of St. Therese of the Child Jesus that remained in the hands of Leonie. Pilgrims from Lisieux had the consolation of arriving in time to view the remains of Leonie, which showed no signs of decomposition despite the summer heat. On Saturday, June 21st, 1941, Monsignor Germain, the director of pilgrimages in Lisieux, presided at her funeral, substituting for the Bishop of Caen, who was ill. 
five members of an order dedicated to St. Therese of the Child Jesus attended the Requiem Mass, preceded by a cortege of 29 priests. Surrounding the coffin, they formed a beautiful and priestly crown around our sister's remains. We then proceeded in procession to the burial of our venerable sister inside the interior crypt of the monastery. Since then, with the cause now, they have moved her burial place into a place into the church where the public have access to it, where we have the great privilege and consolation of being near her tomb. And then they conclude, Now, near the Rose of Lisieux, our deeply missed sister, like a small violet, will look after her visitation family in Caen, and we hope that the church, our holy order, the Carmel, and the entire world, and raise the lowly, God be blessed. Uh, Gradually, as time passed, interest in Leonie began to grow. In the 1960s, there was a flowering of this interest, and it's never stopped since then, such that people began to speak about introducing her cause. And this would be parents of children with disabilities or many situations that seemed hopeless or difficult. Finally, in 2014, a priest went to the Visitation Sisters in Caen and asked that this process begin, and they accepted the request. And so the cause was begun in 2015, and all of the basic work of putting together the documentation has been done, and that's been sent to Rome, and that's where the cause rests now, where that will be examined if the Church judges on review of the extensive documentation put together that Leonie lived a life of heroic holiness, she'll be declared venerable, and then a first and second miracle would lead her to be beatified and canonized. Many graces, abundant graces, are already attributed to her intercession, but that's where things stand at this point. By way of conclusion, I would just like to cite the title of two books written on Leonie. And what I'm remarking on is something we've said already several times, just the astounding trajectory of transformation in this woman's life from where she began to where she concluded. And it's a single person who lived both experiences. The first of these is a book in French by a Father Joël Guibert, and it's a spiritual retreat. So it's his reflections on Léonie in the form of a retreat that you can read through and pray through over a number of days. And his title is Léonie, so it's in French, Léonie, la faiblesse transfigurée. Léonie, la faiblesse transfigurée. So Léonie, weakness transfigured. I want to read it in French because the translation is clumsy. So I suppose to say it a little more elegantly in English, Léonie, a witness to weakness transformed. And I think that's an excellent summary of the entirety of her life and an excellent expression of the hope that she gives to every one of us because that same transformation is available to every one of us. And then the other is just a little popular book in German on Leonie. There is actually a popular level book on Leonie in most commonly used theological languages today, but there's obviously much more yet to come. And this is written by a priest, Father Klaus Peter Vossen. And his title is Leonie Martin. I'll read it in German and give the translation. From Problem Kind, now Problem Kind, you can hear Problem, Problem, and Kind, Child. From a Problem Child zur Hoffnungsträgerin. Hoffnung in uh, German means hope, and Trägerin means bearer. So Leonie Martin, from Problem Child to a Bearer of Hope. From, one, from problem child to one whose life gives hope to us all. And I think that's a fitting way to bring to conclusion our reflections because that is finally what she offers to all of us, just a beautiful, lasting message of hope. Thank you so much, Father Gallagher, for bringing us the fullness of her life because the way that you presented it to us is that it's the realization that we are not alone, and even in our struggles. For Leonie, she's surrounded by a family, a family that has several saints, but in those early days, 
in that household that was so busy with so much activity, with happiness and joy and struggles and pains and uh, concerns and worries from that were assaulting them from the world as well as from within. In some ways, you just never know who's in the house next to you. We all have a story. It's just that in a remarkable way, theirs was preserved for us. But we all have that fullness and those, those hidden violets and daisies and, and roses too. I mean, don't we? Yes, I think we have to say that if this can happen in the life of someone who was so humanly limited as Leonie, who of us can say that this can't happen in, in our lives as well? And the door to holiness is open in a way that can never be shut once we get familiar with Leonie's life. Just thinking as you say this, you touch something else that one of the commentators says about Leonie, that in a, a world in which we live, in which human dignity is stripped from so many people, people treated as you know, lesser and just a, a consumer society in the way that Pope Francis often speaks about it. And Leonie is a witness to the human dignity that every one of us has, to a person from whom that dignity could have easily been taken away and who could have easily surrendered it and who found her dignity, who knew her worth as loved by the Lord, even in espoused to the Lord, as called to an eternity of joy. Leonie, because she is in, in human terms and in a culture in which too often, one person struggles over another person to rise to the top. And she reveals to us the dignity that every one of us has. You know, I, I think I said somewhere along the line, and I feel it a little bit now as we conclude, you sort of hate to see this story end. Mm -hmm. Just to walk with her through this life is so nourishing and so encouraging in so many ways. Of course, the story is just beginning. You know, I mean, her eternal life is uh, still in its very early stages, if we can apply categories of time to it. But as we go through it, a kind of longing awakens within you, a sense of possibilities, a realization that we don't have to settle for less, a realization that so much more lies before us. And again, it's my prayer, really, as we conclude, that she really be that bearer of hope for us, that the title of the book just quoted, and I think she really is that, and may it continue in the church. The great cloud of witnesses that cheer her on, even at the age of two, the novena that was said to St. Margaret Mary, she recovered, she was healed, that little two-year-old, and the joy and the gratitude of the acknowledgement of the family that look we do believe God did do this. It wasn't tossed aside after they received it. There's this constant nurturing of the relationship, not only with God, but with all of the wonderful graces and personages that he places in our lives. And I, I find that really remarkable. The whole family in every aspect, and that's available to us, isn't it? The same gifts are right there with us right now. Yes, it's a striking witness to the spiritual resources and the difference that they can make. And those resources are available, as you say, to all of us. Faith, God, unceasing prayer from the heart, the way Zelie prays for Leonie, and then uh, just the, the Eucharist, Mary. And the fact that these spiritual resources really make a difference. When there, uh, we turn to them with faith, when we bring God into the process of healing and growth, so much more is possible than we would ever believe, which is kind of at the heart of Leonie's whole trajectory throughout her life. Who would have believed? She herself never ceased to marvel at it, as I say. So when we use the human tools, uh, medicine, psychology as we need them, but then at the heart of it, we open ourselves to the power of, of the spiritual means that are available to us, then more can happen than we might ever dare to hope. Uh, it's also a powerful witness to a persevering love on the part of family members for the family member who struggles, a warmth and affection, a willingness to support 
that person through the entirety of her life all the way through and the difference that this made. I think it's quite obvious from what Leonie says in her letters that without this kind of support from her sisters through those many years of religious life and, of course, earlier from her own immediate family, her aunt and uncle and cousins and so forth, none of what we've just seen would have ever happened. She's very, very aware of how much, you know, after communion, it's your letters that are my greatest source of support and so on, which is, I think, an encouragement on the part of all of us to look with love and readiness to assist to the family members who are struggling or experiencing difficulties in any way. So, yes, this is for all of us. I'm wondering, Father Gallagher, what would the hope be for the listener Yes, to get to know who Leonie Martin is, Sister Francois Therese. But also, how can they use her life and her things that spoke to her and her lessons? How can it be transformed now as something, as spiritual food for the one who wants to engage in a relationship with her and with those teachings? Well, I think if uh, a person's interest is awakened, then it would be good to do reading upon, you know, reading on her and use the resources that are available to learn more about her. In English at present, there's really only one biography, and it's a good, a relatively short introduction into her life, and that's Leonie Martin, A Difficult Life, the Sister of St. Therese of Lisieux, and that's written by Marie Baudouin Croix. So it's a translation from a book written in French. That would be a good place to start. And then if a person wants to pursue it further, at present, the next best resources are Leonie's letters. And you can find those in English in the archives of the Carmel of Lisieux. And a Google search for that, archives of the Carmel of Lisieux, will bring up that website. And that's really fun to explore because there's a gold mine of written materials and a lot of very interesting photographs of all the people we've been citing, including a number on, of Leonie. And then to delve into that, you know, in any way that one wishes. In English at present, I think those are the best resources. If I may say it, I think what we've done in these podcasts is to create another resource, which uh, makes available a lot of material, which until now was not available, certainly not in any digital form, and some of it not even in English. So I think this adds a further resource. And then secondly, I would say pray to her, maybe almost firstly, pray to her. In the communion of saints, develop a relationship with her. I find myself having done this, you know, over a number of months, you know, this reading and exploration of her life, turning to her quite frequently now with a sense of hope. Sometimes Therese and her together, sometimes together with their parents. But Leonie, in her own special way, when I feel that whatever task I'm beginning, uh, I don't know if I have the ability to do it well or how it's going to work out or any kind of concern or worry. It's so it's becoming easy for me now just to think of her and her struggles as she faced things and from her eternity now to ask for her help in this. So I would say learn more about her and pray to her, probably the two best ways to get closer to Leonie. And my guess is that we will experience, as so many have before us, which is why there's a cause of canonization now, that those prayers are really heard. I was listening to a talk by, this was a priest who was in charge of activities around Therese in Lisieux, and he was commenting how both he and those in charge in Alençon uh, where they receive many requests uh, for prayers. Uh, Therese and uh, Leonie, he says, we not only have the confidence that these prayers are heard, but we have the evidence because we have seen so many prayers answered. And that's going to be my bet if people turn to Leonie. A lot of hope will come and a lot of grace will enter our lives. And to live the little way. As you read it and you, want, and you take that into your prayer, she's a living example it can happen. It, it does transform your life. The more uh, we learn about Therese, the more we'll understand Leonie, because uh, she is really the key, as we've said many times. So that is another way to get to know Leonie. Delve into Therese, and you are essentially delving into Leonie as well. Father Gallagher, thank you very it's much. It's been my privilege. Thank you for making this happen. 
You've been listening to A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leonie Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it on the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leonie Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher.